Or perhaps he was for this reason separated from you for a while, that you would have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If then you regard me a partner, accept him as you would me, but if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it, not to mention to you that you owe me even your own self as well. Yes, brother, let me benefit from you and the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you since I know that you will do even more than what I say. At the same time, I also, at the same time, also prepare me a lodging, for I hope that through your prayers I will be given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Okay, so I thought, just as kind of a way of review and a way to, to uh, get to the second part of this letter, um, I kind of summarized it in a different manner than we, we were looking at last week, just to look at the arguments that the Apostle Paul is giving um, to Philemon, for Philemon to forgive Onesimus, and for Philemon to accept uh, Onesimus back as a brother in Christ. And he gives actually ten arguments here in, uh, in this passage. Ten arguments to Philemon to accept. And if you weren't here last week, Philemon, and you just uh, we just read, we gleaned some things from this book. Just to give you the gist of it, Paul is sending back Onesimus. Uh, Paul's in prison in Rome. Onesimus is a runaway slave. He ran away from Philemon in Colossae. And um, he probably stole something. We don't know what, money, something. He ran away. He went to Rome to try to hide himself, probably, in the greatest, the largest population in the whole world at that time. A city, a huge city, this huge city of Rome. And somehow he got together with Paul. And through Paul, Onesimus became a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and was transformed. And so Paul is going to send Onesimus back so that he can be reconciled with another brother, Philemon, whom he ran away from. And that's what Paul is doing here. He sent this letter along with the letter to the church of Colossians. There's a lot of similarities between Colossians and this letter. Um, they were sent at the same time with the same people. Onesimus delivering this letter, uh, Philemon, to um, his, form, his master. I was going to say his former master, but he's still his master. Considered under Roman law, he was uh, a slave of Philemon. <clears throat> so here are the arguments that the Apostle Paul puts forth to Philemon um, in order for him to accept his slave back again and forgive him and receive him into fellowship as a fellow brother. Number one, we see in verse 9, it just said, Paul saying, listen to me. That is, to Paul, he's a man. He says, I'm, I'm an old man. I'm a man who's grown old. And what he's trying to put forth is, I've, I've grown old serving the Lord Jesus Christ. So he wants him to say, I've served Christ a long time. I want you to hear what I have to say. Um, Number, another second argument is, I am now a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Um, and I think what Paul may be indicating by that, uh, that statement, um, is he's, he's putting forth, surely compared to the hardship of his imprisonment, um, he's asking a smaller favor, a small favor of Onesimus. Another argument that we see put forth is um, the idea that he's, he's kind of saying, besides, I'm, I am your friend who loves you. 
and I admire you for the manner in which you have again and again and again refreshed the hearts of the saints, how you have shown your love before them, to, um, shown your love to them, and shown your faith and passed on your faith that you have in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that you are a man of faith and love. And we talked about that last time, about looking for evidences of grace and encouraging people with evidences of grace. And that's what Paul is doing also in this letter. And here's the fourth one, and I think it's one of three that I think are the major arguments. But uh, number four is that the idea, and it's seen in verse six, that we are in debt to God for all the grace and the goodness that he has shown to us. And because of that grace, we, we are to pass on that faith, which is a gift of God's grace also. Um, so we're in debt to God for all the goodness that he has poured out upon us in Christ Jesus. Argument number five, and this isn't, again, these aren't necessarily in order how they come up in the text. But, uh, number five is, Onesimus is my child, my very heart. Um, he's a brother that is beloved to me. He's a brother whom I love. And so that's an argument. I, I, I love you, Philemon. I love him. I'm a, I want you to love him. Why are you calling like that argument? Huh? Why are you calling that argument? Was it an argument or was that a discussion? Well, it's not a discussion. He's putting forth, I, I don't know, for lack of a better word, if you can think of a better word, an argument for Philemon to accept. Um, Proof text. Yeah. It, it, maybe his desires, if you want to put it that way. Are you um, asking Julie what he, the different the things that he's going through, the different numbers? The different no, no, I ask her why he called an argument. Uh, an argument I would. I will see a different, maybe I... Maybe Evidence, how about that? Evidence. Reasons, a reason why. Yeah, if that helps you, that's fine. Re yeah. Reasons, yeah. Reason, yeah. An argument isn't always, you know, we think of arguments as yelling. That's, there's also in theology and philosophy and other things, there's arguments made for that's a certain funny. position. That's what I mean, how I'm using the argument like here. In the, in the court of law, you would make an argument right. for your case. Right, right, that's how... That's how I'm using the word here. But if it helps reasons or his desires, if it helps you better to think about what he's doing, then, then that's fine, too. Yeah, well, I'm, well, my thinking is not as good as yours. So well, no, no, that's no, a good question. Sense. Good question. Yeah, because often, that's our first thought. We think when someone says argument, we think of somebody, <laughs> you know, going at each other, you know, with, with an argument. And that's not what he's doing here. Matter of fact, he's very gracious in the way that he's yeah, well, going about this. Yeah, that's why I see okay. yeah. it's pleading. Right there, there you go. Or appeal. That's yeah. the word I've used last week too. So you've got to be consistent. Yeah. So these are appeals. <laughs> this is how Paul is appealing to Onesimus. So we'll be consistent. <laughs> uh, number six. Argument number six is. It is to your advantage to grant my request that you accept Onesimus for the once useless one has now become useful. He, he has a play on words because Onesimus' name means useful. But he wasn't very useful. He ran away. He was useless. But now he's, he's living up to his name. He's been tremendously useful to the Apostle Paul. So much for that he would love to keep him there. He's become such a fellow soldier, a, a, a fellow partner in the gospel. Um, so now he's returning him, and it's to his advantage because he's now he was useless to you before. Now he is useful. So um, that's argument number six. We see that in verses 11, 13, and 14. Uh, argument number seven, and we'll go over these other arguments as we go to the text in just a minute that we didn't go over last week. Um, number seven is the idea he's, he's asking when Emma's asking Onesimus, listen, favorable action on your, I'm, I'm fine, excuse me, thank you. Favorable action on your part would be in line with God's providential direction. We see that in uh, verse 15 and 22. He said, remember, perhaps, 
It is because God wants to return him to you as a now a brother in Christ, not just a slave, but a brother in Christ. And in God's providence, this whole circumstance happened and occurred by his permission so that he would come to Rome, he would hear the gospel, he, he probably heard it before from Philemon, but you know there's many people that have heard, heard the gospel many times, and there's one time when the Holy Spirit just, boom, comes down, and they finally get it. And so I think that's what happened with Onesimus. He's in Rome, I'm sure he's, I'm sure he's feeling guilty, about running away, probably stealing some property. And what do you do with this guy? Guilt can weigh on you. And he hears the gospel again from the Apostle Paul. And now it's really good news. It's really good news to him. So in God's providence, he did that so that Philemon could receive him as, as a brother. And that was God's plan and that was God's timing in the whole situation. Number eight, uh, the fellowship of all believers in Christ demands this. For not only are you and I, and this is kind of what he's arguing with Philemon, not only are you and I included in this, but so is Onesimus. Listen, we were included in the plans of God. God loved us from before the foundations of the earth he chose to adopt us in the Lord Jesus Christ. He chose to make us his, his own children. Well, Philemon Onesimus is now included in that group. And that's what he's doing here. He's reminding them, guess what? We're all on equal footing. You may be master on this level. You may be master and he may be, may be slave. But on this level... We're brothers and sisters in Christ. He uses that word, by the way, several times. Brother. Beloved brother. He uses that several times in his letter. And sister. Remember, Aphia is dear sister in the Lord. So we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Philemon, remember, now that Onesimus has come to Christ, guess what he is now to you? He's a brother. Number nine, he just simply states, I, I have confidence because of your past love, how you've shown your love for Christ and for others. I have confidence in you that you obey. You can see that in verse 21. And the tenth argument that he uses, he says, and this is, this is toward the, at the end of the, the chapter. He says, I want you to prepare a guest room for me, for I hope and answer the prayers of God's children to be granted to you. And I think by saying that, I think he was just kind of saying, surely you would not wish to be, um, you would not wish to disappoint my eyes, so to speak, by when I come to you and see what's happening. Remember, I, I think Paul probably did, because he's writing from Rome, and this is the first Roman imprisonment. And there uh, is a second one. It's not the second one is not there's there seems to be a fourth missionary journey of Paul. There were three that's recorded for us in the book of Acts. There seems to be a fourth between his first imprisonment in Rome and his second imprisonment in Rome, where he was not released. Where history tells us, not, we don't find in scriptures, but history tells us that Paul was beheaded the second time that he was imprisoned in Rome. But between that time, there was a, a, another journey and then the imprisonment. And I'm sure that he probably did visit Philemon. We don't know, it's not recorded for us, but it was definitely a possibility that he did. Those are the ten arguments, but let's back up and go. We're not going to, well, I think we left off in going through the verses. Um, was it verse 7 that we had gone through? We hadn't gotten to Paul, or the, the right. appeal, the actual right. appeal, right? So, that's where we're at. Uh, Philemon, 
8, verses 8 through 16. Let me just read that again, and then we'll take a look at this. Therefore, though I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do what is proper, yet for love's sake I rather appeal to you, since I am such a person as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment, who formerly was useless to you, but now is useful both to you and to me. I have sent him back to you in person, that is, sending my very heart, whom I wish to keep with me, so that on your behalf he might minister to me in my imprisonment for the gospel. But without your consent, I did not want to do anything so that your goodness would be would not be in effect by compulsion, but of your own free will. For perhaps he was for this reason separated from you for a while, that you would have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a brother, a beloved brother, especially to me, but now much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if we could sum up, in one phrase, in one sentence, what Paul is asking Onesimus to do, what would it be? What is Paul asking Onesimus to do? What's that? Asking Philemon. Asking Philemon. Yes, sorry, Philemon. What is Paul? I keep doing that. Don't. <laughs> what is Paul asking Philemon to do? Right. To forgive and to receive. Yeah. I mean that. I mean that's basically what he's doing, isn't it? He wants him to forget. To forgive and to forget. Better than that. Yeah. See him as a beloved brother. Hard yeah. to do forget. See, what is interesting to me about this is I think the main point of Philemon is this, that Philemon is about Relationships. And not just the relationships of Paul and Onesimus and Philemon, but about the relationship that changes all of the relationships. I think that's that's what Philemon is, is about. Speaking of changes that were made in lives. Let's think about each person for a minute. Let's think about the Apostle Paul. Um, how was the Apostle Paul changed by his relationship to Christ? And then therefore it transformed his relationship to others. How, how, how was he transformed? Completely. Yeah. What's that? Well, specifically, I mean, it's in Acts. Yeah, what was, I know. What was Paul doing? What was Paul doing before he, was, he encountered he Christ? He was throwing the believers in prison. And he, he hated Christ. Yeah. He hated Christ, and he hated his followers. And he wanted to see them in prison or dead as he held the coat as they were stoning Stephen. Right. Um, that, was, that was the desire, the evil, wicked desire of his heart. So, what happened? Next thing he's saying, Lord, is that you? He's on the road to Damascus to do some more of that. And he knocked off his mount and he encounters Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is transformed. Before he persecuted the, the followers of Christ and hated them and hated Christ, now he loves Jesus and loves his people and wants to see more and more people come into the kingdom and to see them grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he spends the rest of his life in hard labor doing that, that very thing. That's, a, that's an incredible transformation. Persecutor, now he's persecuted. Yeah. He's being persecuted. Let's take Philemon. 
we can only guess. And Philemon, we can, we, it's recorded for us for the Apostle Paul. We can only guess at Philemon, but apparently he was, he seems to have been a rich Roman citizen, wealthy Roman citizen. Without Christ, what would that have meant? He could do anything he pleased to anyone he pleased to do it to. Just about, except for another Roman citizen. There were rights, yeah. We don't, we don't know what he was like beforehand, but we know God, Christ performs a miracle of transformation in everyone who receives Christ as Savior and Lord. So who knows how he treated his slaves, how he treated his wife, treated his family. There were no laws in Rome governing who knows what mistresses or anything else that was going on, that could have been going on. But we don't know that, but we know that one way or another, Philemon's life was transformed. And we know it was transformed, um, at least on the positive end of it, is that Paul is praising him because he continually hears. He's continually hearing about how Philemon is refreshing the hearts of the saints. People are coming through in need, and Philemon is meeting that need. And he loves the people of God so much, he has the church in his home. And Paul must have led him to Christ. Because he says, you owe, my, right. you owe me your life. Right. And that was probably, the, the, the commentators think that, was pro that probably took place in Ephesus. Because up to this point in time, Paul had never been in Colossae. So he, he was probably in Ephesus, where um, I'm sure he was a businessman. I don't know, he was probably in Ephesus for some reason, and that's where he encountered the teaching of the Apostle Paul. And finally he became a, a Christian. There is amazing how God orchestrated everything. Yeah, and how he got him together. That's right. Because he stole money. Right. He was being by name. He ran into Paul. Right. He heard the gospel. Right. So, and his divine grace. And think about how all that had to work together between the three people because Paul had to be saved. Philemon had to be saved 100 miles away from his home, which is about how far Ephesus is from Colossae. He had to be saved. Mm -hmm. And now Onesimus is saved. And God is reconciling, not only to reconcile them, their relationship with God, but then now He's reconciling them. Yeah. It's just amazing. And His providence and His sovereign grace. Yes, it is. It's good. So Onesimus then. We it's recorded for us here, also, at least some things. How was Onesimus changed? Remember what he was? He was a worthless slave who stole money from his master and took off with it and ran away. So, how was Onesimus transformed? It says, I mean, verse 10, the way I read it, it says, I appeal to you my, for my child Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment. Could he possibly have been in prayer with Paul? And maybe really um, well, I don't know, or at least he had, he had to come in contact with Paul that way Somewhere in Rome because in Paul was, I, my understanding is, I went back and looked at it again, Paul was probably, at his expense, was imprisoned in a, in a house. He was renting a house. He was chained to a soldier. And um, so <laughs> somehow Onesimus came in contact with him. He could have... He could receive visitors in, in the house. He was just chained to the soldier. Um, the Christian soldiers. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> he, heard, he heard everything that went on in that house, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, probably. Yeah, so go ahead. Well, did you finish, Travis? Yeah. Oh. I was just thinking that that's, I mean, he came in contact with Paul, and Paul, I'm sure, led him to Christ. Right. Well, what are some evidences just from Philemon that we see there was change in Onesimus? So he came to Christ, but what are some evidences of grace in Onesimus? That he served Paul, that he's willing to go back and face the consequences yeah. of his actions. Yeah. Paul was really going to miss him. Mm -hmm. He was really an encouragement to Paul and 
a fellow worker. He was he was really serving. Here's a guy before that didn't care, and he didn't care about so much. He just ran away and he stole from before. And now the apostle Paul, he's serving him wholeheartedly. Um, he loves the Lord Jesus. He is he has now become useful useful to Paul. So yeah. And, and he's willing to go back to seek to be reconciled. And you know, there, there, there probably was, because we're human, there's probably some fear. Because remember, there was very little laws protecting slaves. Um, he virtually could have <coughs> tortured him and even killed him. Um, there was no laws protecting a, a runaway slave from that. So the I imagine that would come up in his mind, you know, uh, being human, and that he had to trust the Lord for that. So he's he wants to go back, and he did go back and deliver the, the letter. And that's a lot of trust. He's trusting Christ, even though he had sinned, and even though he deserved, you know, he was he was already getting much better than he deserved. All of us are, isn't that, isn't that true? There had to be some fear, and yet he turned that fear into trust, and saying, I, I trust God for what God's going to do. And I think Paul had a lot of confidence in Philemon. Because he, he shows that continually through the letter, that Philemon will de- do even more than he asks. Well, you know, he calls him no longer a slave, he calls him a beloved brother. And in verse 15, where he says, but you, but you would have him back forever. That means that Onesimus's heart was not in his work before he ran right. away. Right, exactly. He was useless. But now it was going to be, his heart was going to be in it. Right. Because he was working it unto the Lord. Right. Good. So, Jesus Christ transformed these three lives. And I think... What we need to realize is that yes, it's about relationships, and we're thinking of, when we read the letter, we think of it on this level, you know, Paul, Philemon, Onesimus. But it is Christ that stands at the center of this letter. That's who stands at the center. It is in him all who believe have been made free. They've been transformed from darkness into, in, into light by his death. Resurrection and ascension into heaven is, is theirs. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ has set Paul, he set Onesimus, he set Philemon free. And now he's asking that freedom that is in Christ is coming into fruition in their lives. And that's what's going to happen here. So in Christ, Paul is no longer a slave to the powers of this present evil age. In Christ, Paul has been raised up to become a son. He's been adopted. He's an heir, a fellow heir of Jesus Christ, a child of the heavenly glorified Lord. He's no longer a prisoner on this level. He's a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Gladly so, because of the grace poured out upon him. But remember, this is what Paul, I think, his big argument is in this whole letter. letter. And so is Philemon and Onesimus. They're in Christ too. They too are made members of the Lord of glory. They, are, they will be risen. They will ascend. They are seated in the heavenly places in Him. They are members of the church. They are heirs of light. They are sons of glory, of the King of glory. Slave Onesimus is in Christ. He's raised up even now to glory, not yet fully revealed. Master Philemon is in Christ. He's lifted up to the heavenly arena and seated with the slaves of King Jesus, even now in glory. So the relationships of this letter have been transformed. Together, and this is what Paul's reminding Philemon of, together they are sons. They are children. They are heirs. 
all of them are no longer slaves, at least slaves to our sins. They're no longer slaves to Satan. They're no longer under the domain of Satan. But now they are, those three, our beloved brothers. No longer master, but a beloved brother. No longer slave, but a beloved brother. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ has transformed them all. And I think that is the main argument of this letter. That is the main appeal that the Apostle Paul is making to Philemon. Especially going back to verse 6. He says, Remember who you are in Christ and what Christ has done for you. And then continue to do what you've already been doing, exercising your faith out to others, giving your faith away. He says, now just simply do that to Onesimus. Philemon, I want you to do that. Same thing that you've been doing to others, to Onesimus. And again, I think I, I, think I mentioned it last week, but just the a summation not only of verse 6, but I think of this of this book. Colossians, remember, is closely related to this book. It was sent at the same time, written to the Colossians church. This was more directed toward Philemon. But in Colossians chapter 3, verses 9 through 11, it says this. Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. And you have put on the new self, who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no more distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man. But Christ is all in all. And that's the main argument that Paul is putting forward to Philemon. In Christ changes everything. He changes all relationships. Well, we're going to get through this. Any other any questions or comments on that section? We need to go to the next one. But any other uh, on that section, verses eight through uh, sixteen. That's also in um, in Colossians. Forgive, forgive others as Christ has forgiven you. That little phrase is in Colossians, the book of Colossians. And Philemon would have read that also because that was sent to the church in Colossae. Yeah. Good. So Christ changes all relationships because. He's the one who saves. How exactly does that occur? And Paul becomes a picture, in the next few verses, a picture of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. So catch that in these next few verses, verses 17 through 21, how Paul is a picture of Christ. If then you regard me a partner, accept him as you would me. But if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing you this with my own hand. I will repay it, not to mention to you that you owe to me even your own self as well. Yes, brother, let me benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you since I know that you will do even more than I say. So how is Paul then picturing Christ in this statement that he makes um, concerning uh, Onesimus to Philemon? And what's, what's going on here? How does he picture Christ? Charging on his debt to, to Paul? Yeah, to his account. 
What is that? What is that the doctrine of? What do we? Yeah. It's a. It's, a, it's substitution, right? Right. And but what else we we use another term also. We talk about accounts, remember? That our sins are put into Christ's account. And he died on the cross for them. And his righteousness is put on ours. Remember the, the theological term? You may not for that. Imputation. That. And that's what Paul's saying. You, you put that. You set that and put that into my account. What did Christ do? That's, that's what Christ did. Our sins were put into his account. Um, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. That's the first half of the verse. That's the doctrine of imputation. The Father made the Son to be sin on our behalf. Our sins were imputed into his account. Christ hung there on the cross, having our sins put upon him and his hand. He wasn't sinful. He was sinless. But our sins were placed in his account upon Christ and the wrath of the Father was poured out on his own Son in our place. That's substitution. Also. So Paul is picturing and I'm sure he probably heard some of that teaching in Ephesians you know, in, in, uh, in, when he was in Ephesus uh, Philemon. And Paul is reminding him again. Listen, I want do what do what I'm. I'm going to be what Christ was to you. You put that into my account, and I think it was a reminder of what Christ had done for Philemon. I think that's what's going on here. Any other comments on that? So that's one thing that he's picturing uh, is the idea of imputation. Substitution. What else do we see here? I think there's two other things. Let's see if you can see them. It's talking about um, we owe his life to Paul, so oh. we owe our, our life to Christ. Yeah. Right. Paul. So Paul's reminder. Uh, very good, Travis. That's another thing. Paul's reminder of what Philemon owed him, because. God's grace had, pre had reached Philemon through Paul. I think that's what Paul... Paul's in his letter, if you read Colossians or Ephesians, Paul is ultimately pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he said, listen, God in his love for you and in his loving providence and sovereign providence brought us together. You heard the gospel through me, and so I, in a sense, on a human level, became your spiritual father. So in that, in, in that way, you, you, you owe me, but ultimately, it is because of the grace of Christ. So, this illustrates the doctrine of grateful obedience. Doesn't it? Is what, I mean, look what Christ has given us, our God has given us through Christ. His grace is has been poured out upon us so that we have, what we mentioned earlier, we have, we have been forgiven, we have been saved, we have been transferred from the, the kingdom of Satan into the domain of his dear son, the kingdom of the dear son. We have been adopted so that we cry out, Father, Abba, Father. We are fellow heirs with Jesus Christ. What Christ inherited, can, can, have you ever tried to grasp that? What Christ inherits, you inherit. That's incredible. We are fellow heirs with Jesus Christ. So, in a sense, we are, we are under a, I want to add this word to a wonderful obligation, if you, if you will. Or, as genuine Christians, we will respond to that in grateful obedience. And so I think that's what, how Paul is picturing Christ 
in this instance. Because Christ has bought us, uh, excuse me, because Christ has brought us God's grace, we have an obligation to obey Christ. But it's a wonderful obligation. It's not something, a duty, you know, I have to do this. It's great, it's a grateful response to what Christ has done for us. So that's how I think the Apostle Paul's picturing Christ. And this is what you owe me. Didn't, uh, the Bible tells us, owe no man anything but to, what, do you, what are we supposed to owe them? Owe no man anything but to love one another. Right? So, we, if we owe that to one another, boy, do we really owe that right, to Christ. And didn't Christ say that? If you love me, you'll what? My you'll keep my commandments. Right. So, loving gratitude it should be the Christian's response to what Christ has done for us, the grace that he's poured out upon us. I think that, on a human level, is what Paul is reminding by the end. I think there's one other thing here. So, the, the, the doctrine of, of grateful obedience, the doctrine of uh, imputation, what else might we see here? How is Paul picturing Christ? I think there's at least one more, one more way. What's Paul's very first statement? is the same, to be the same to Philemon as Paul is. Mm -hmm. That yeah. there's not to be any difference. So accept him as you would accept me. So he uses the word acceptance. So that's a good word. So what, what is that picture in Christ? Our, doesn't it, our acceptance by the Father because of Christ. The Father accepts us as he accepts who? His own dear beloved son. He accepts us just like he accepts his son. That's what it means to be in Christ. We are union. The, the idea of union with Christ. We're united with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Father, and this really astounded me, and I, I read it, I just read it again. And I don't know, it still just astounds me and floors me every time I hear this, and I want to <coughs> kind of reject it at first. But I was reading, uh, knowing. In, in Knowing God by J.I. Packer, and I'm just looking at something again in, on the love of God in, in the book. And he made this statement, and I just don't know why I'm really hesitant about it, but he says, God loves us exactly like he loves his own son. And I heard different from, uh, wow. what's his name? The one they wrote there on the, on the cross. What's his name? Yeah, mm -hmm. he said that Christ loved, um, God loved us more than Christ because he gave his only son for us. Well, that one I really hesitate at. <laughs> I, I don't know. But I, 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 because, I because he, he can't do that. He can't even do that because we're in Christ. Maybe I'm if we're united to Christ, we're united to Christ. He accepts us because of the beloved. So he's not going to love us more than Christ. But I think what's astounding to me is that he loves us like he loves his own son. As he loves his own son. That's what's astounding to me. That's incredible to me. That he would do that. And yet that's, that's our acceptance. Because we're in Christ. We are accepted because of the beloved. Because of the beloved. What a, what a wonderful thing. So those are the three things I see. I don't know if you see anything else. But those are the three p ways that Paul is picturing the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's picturing the Lord Jesus Christ not only to us, but I think to Philemon also. Anything else there? I'm sure you probably pulled something out of 21, but I'm, I'm having confidence in your obedience. You know? So he, Paul has confidence in him and as, as a brother, right. as, as Christ does, because he gives us responsibilities as well. Right. Well, I want to 
to get to one thing. I, I'm going to, we're going to have to close here in five minutes. Um, I kind of want to look at the closing remarks and just want to bring one thing out um, that, I, that just caught my eye. But um, let's just read the closing remarks. Usually we don't look at those and then there's not much there, and, you know. He says, at the same time, also prepare me a lodging for I hope that through your prayers I will be given to you. And Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, verse 24, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And there's two things I just wanted to bring out here. And one of them had to do with the list of names. Um, there's a couple names that stand out here, but but which one of these names stands out to you as being if, that you know something about them from another Luke. another letter? Well, Luke, yes, and Mark, and Mark yes, and Demas. What do we know about Demas? <laughs> hmm? Do you remember? See, we see Demas mentioned in all of the, the uh, prison epistles, Ephesians, uh, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And those are the ones that they believe that were written from the first Roman imprisonment. Um, and all these names are mentioned in those letters. So that these are fellow workers of the Apostle Paul that are working along with him in kingdom work uh, in, in Rome but we read something really sad about Demas and we'll find it in 1st Tim 2nd Timothy 14 now remember I'm going to tell you when this was written those Philemon was written during the first Roman imprisonment the, pres the pastoral epistles 1st mm -hmm. Timothy 2nd Timothy and Titus <coughs> Seem to have been written in the second, in the second Roman prison, and so between that time, between the time of the first imprisonment, and then we believe that there was another missionary journey, and then he was <coughs> arrested again and went on trial, and then was beheaded. Um, between those, that that the first and the second imprisonment, this happened. 2 Timothy 4.10, it says, says this, For Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Christians has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. That is just so sad to me, because it's sad to me. As I read this here, you have two people, several, you have Luke and Demas, and Aristarchus and Mark and Paphras and the Apostle Paul working side by side in the kingdom for the gospel and you can have two different reasons <coughs> for doing so. One is genuine love for Jesus Christ. And that's why, that's your motive for doing it. Not out of some duty or not out of somebody else's expectation on a human level. Or not out of, because you just feel guilty if you don't do it, <coughs> or whatever, but out of love for the Lord Jesus Christ and gratitude for what the grace that He's has been poured out on us in Jesus Christ, you would serve the Lord. <coughs> and another one, who has the love of the world in his heart. And you, they're working together, and you can't tell. Paul couldn't tell. Not until he left and decided, I'm not doing this anymore. I want to go have a good time. Bye. And that's very sad. And, we, and that's very something we need to guard against in our own hearts. You know? um, what's our motive for doing things? Is it the motive that I think Paul is giving to Philemon? 
Look what Christ did for you. Forgive Onesimus as Christ has forgiven you. Remember the treasures, all the good things you have in Christ. And then give that to Philemon. I mean to Onesimus. But I, I, I just found that very sad because this is the same Demas that's mentioned here as a fellow worker. And then he leaves. And there's another comment on that. They went out from us because what, do you remember the rest of that verse? They were the world. Us because they were not of us. What a, what a sad, <clears throat> sad thing. But it ends, I'm going to quickly end this, but it ends on, on a great note here. Um, Paul's final prayer. What is it? What is Paul's final prayer for five minutes? He begins the letter with grace. Grace and peace to you. We have peace because of his grace. And he ends the letter with grace. And his appeal is because of grace. Because of the grace that he has in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's his continual prayer, is for grace. And in Ephesians, and, and again, a, a closely related letter because he wrote them all uh, and while he was in prison in Rome. But in Ephesians, it tells us that not only that by grace you've been saved through faith, and not of yourselves, but it also tells us that in the ages that come, not only now, but in the ages to come, Christ will continue to pour out his grace upon us. Or God will continue to pour out his grace upon us in Christ Jesus. And that's his prayer. It's not just some kind of hopeful, vague wish. It's a confidence in a God who loves to pour his grace out on his people. And a confident statement that that's what that God is going to do in Philemon's life. He's going to continue to pour out his grace upon him just as he has been doing it. On him and his household and on the church. And what a great promise for us. That he will continue on his people whom he loves dearly. As his own son, he will continue to pour out that grace and that love upon us. Not only in the past through Christ, not only in the present, but through all eternity. What a great, great promise. All right. Travis, would you close us, Mark? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we, we come to you humble and, and uh, gracious, uh, the, uh, loving you uh, beyond all other means. Lord, we just thank you for being a sovereign God, a loving God, a just God. And uh, so we see through this that Paul is. Uh, so enamored with you and so much in love with you and he sees that uh, you love these other people in Philemon and you love us that uh, he knows that we will accept um, the, uh, the love and the, and the graciousness and we'll extend that to others uh, I just know that um, we will do that as a church we will do that as brothers and sisters in Christ just as Paul has confidence um, in Philemon, I'm sure that we have confidence in one another that we will act in such a way that we show grace and mercy and love as you show grace, mercy, and love. I just thank you for all these things, Lord. Thank you for this um, time that Randy has prepared. And uh, thank you for using him. Thank you for uh, giving him the strength and the wisdom and the knowledge to be able to teach this, Lord. It's not an easy job. It's not an easy chore to, chore to be lifted up into a position as an elder. We just thank you for this church. 